Hello guys and welcome to another video slash podcast slash YouTube talky thing and we are in episode two you would hopefully you would have heard episode one if not um, it will be in the pause for security uh, sort of playlist where you can go back and listen to my episode one um, and the difference between episode one and episode two is I have managed to sign a co-host I've signed him up for a, possibly a, a one-year deal, but we'll see how it all goes. Hopefully, unlike Pogba, he won't turn down the 300 grand a week I have offered him. So we'll, we'll see how this all goes. But what I'll do is I'll hand you over to uh, the new co-host for Pause for Security, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, a lot of you probably know, know him anyway. Um, but yeah, I'll just pass it over to you, and you can introduce yourself and let us know who you are. What's happening, guys? And please welcome back Security 101. Yes, I am back. Uh, Michael dug me up from the deepest office corners of Devon <laughs> and uh, invited me to come and co-host this podcast. Um, I feel very honoured, so thank you, Michael. And everyone, give him a big cheer. Get some likes out there for him. Make sure there's some comments down below thanking him because he's dragged my ass straight onto here after work. So I hope everyone's been doing well. Um, I heard some of you guys have been asking about me, uh, Porsche K9, much respect buddy, and Adrian were checking in on my welfare, and all the usual characters, I hope everyone's doing well. So uh, yeah, Michael, should we just crack on? Yeah, let's crack on. So where where have you been for the last probably, say, two or three months? Because you've been, you've not, you've not been missing in action, but you've obviously, you've had a bit, a bit of a change in terms of the dog and things like that. Um, so last time, most people would have known you, you was a dog handler, working with your dog, doing site work, et cetera. But um, over the last couple of months, a little bit has changed. Yeah, so uh, I've kind of, I've took a back step um, from, from the dog world. Um, I'm working as a supervisor role for my uh, company. I, I was doing anyway when I was a dog handler. Um, and I've just sort of took a back step. My dog's pretty much retired now he's like well semi-retired he still does odds ends with me but not a lot he's at home most of the time so he's living the life of Riley he's quite happy um, and I'm quite happy to be fair I feel a lot less stressed knowing that he's safe at home he doesn't have to put himself in harm's way anymore um, in regards to the work side I'm, I'm still doing that work I'm still getting outside doing my job but I'm also taking on other responsibilities and um, you know just sort of trying to work my way towards the, uh, the management side of things um hopefully to head down that route you know give myself a better career i mean i've been doing this well 10 years now plus and i, I think it's time for a change <laughs> yeah. is it is this a decision that you made you, you made a while ago because I, I said to you the other day when i spoke to you and sort of caught up myself because i wasn't 100 percent sure what happened because i said to you about i've noticed with handlers that are looking to come out of the industries that you can it's a kind of telltale style a telltale sign when someone's got a dog that's maybe six seven eight but they don't have a backup so is that something that you'd thought about like a, a little while ago and thought well i'm not going to get another dog because i don't want to train one up and then have to try and sell it or have to hand the dog over to someone else yeah yeah um in reg regards to like having a second dog i mean when he got to, when i got like when he got to six years old um, I kind of knew at that point it was just like I'm, I'm not doing this again you know I've had too many exper bad experiences and and with the way the industry is going as a whole now it's 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 getting too risky um, and I don't feel the reward is worth the effort anymore um, that's just my personal opinion obviously I you know I love everyone who does it and if you do it properly you can make a good living out of it mm -hmm. uh, perfect example you yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, with the yeah the dog side of it, I'm just happy that he can take a break. I was thinking of getting another dog, and if I did get another dog, it would have been one of his pups because I either wanted his temperament. He's got an excellent temperament for a working dog. I mean, and it's something I've not taught him. It's something he was he just had from a puppy um, growing up. Is that he can be at home, most chilled out, calm dog, lying on the ground, getting belly rubs playing with his mom, running around the house, you know, being a normal dog, take him to the park, let him off the leash, let him do his thing. But the moment he goes into goes into work on the moment, I pour a working lead on him and put my uniform on. Complete change, different dog. I think that, but I think that's probably it's 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 about the dog and a dog and his temperament or but most of it is about how you bring the dogs up, isn't it? If like when they're 
at an early age, if you do treat them as a pet to start off with, they learn how to be a pet. I think um, sometimes with with some people and their dogs is that they try and rush the dog into being a working dog too quickly and they don't teach the dog how to be a pet. So when you take the dog home, it doesn't, sometimes they just don't know how to be in that environment because you've tried to pump it into being a, a, a working dog so early. And I think that's one of the most important things that my trainer said to me is that when, when you get a puppy, just let it be a puppy, like bring it in, let people say hello. Don't stop people from saying hello to the dog because all you really do is you kind of teach that dog that people are bad. And at the end of the day, when you've got to take that dog home, people aren't bad. You, you want to be able to take your dog to down the road. You want to be able to invite people into your house without a fear of like someone getting bitten and that. So although it is kind of the genetics of the dog, it's also about how you bring it up as well. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, completely agree with you there. Um, so I've got a, I've got a, a friend, well, a, a friend and also a colleague that used to work with me, um, young lad called George. He's actually a follower of yours. Um, he watches you quite a lot, and he, he's in the uh, Discord from time to time. Um, but like, he he wants to become a dog handler, and I've kind of tried to instill in him that my dog is not what you want as a dog. It's like he's good. But he has his bad points just because over the years of us working, we've had so many situations where people have used his, um, let's say, kindness. They've used the fact that he is sociable with people to gain that distance and get close and then turn the aggression on. And now he is very wary of people um, as he's got older. So he hasn't got the perfect temperament anymore. Um, but I've always said you've got to have a 50-50 balance. It's got to be 50% working dog and 50% pet. Yeah. That's the perfect balance. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, you can you can do all the training in the world, but you can never you can never train for the experiences the dogs the dog's gonna have. And it's a bit like it's a bit like having a kid, and you can teach the kid to be the nicest kid ever. If he turns up to school and gets punched in the face one day, well, the next day he turns up, he's not gonna be the same kid because he's gonna be wary that he might get punched in the face. Therefore, he is more likely to punch someone in the face first. So you can do all the training, you can do all the training in the world, but you can never control what someone else is going to do to your dog. And then sometimes it is very hard to convince the dog is like, no, that's just a one-off. It's very hard to say, no, that was a one-off. That won't happen again because the next time someone walks on, the dog's going to think, well, I'm going to hit him before he hits me. So it, it, it is it is one of the things, and I think once the, once dogs have gone through working for a certain amount of time, is that it, it, it will happen that something that happened that may change the attitude of the dog towards certain people. It may just be in certain situations, but it may be a, a total thing where, where wherever you are, it has that kind of reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Um, as I said, you know, it, it is. It's just it's all based through experiences. Yeah. You can't you can't see the path ahead until you're at it. You know what I mean? It's 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 impossible. It's the same with people. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get to our let's get to our first talking point um, of this episode. And it was something that came through the Discord. Um, there was a dog handler working a site, um, and he had another dog handler turn up to the site to work with him for a shift. And when he got the dog out, um, when he got the dog out, the handler that I know noticed straight away that there was something wrong with the dog. And um, he said to the handler that you need to go and you need to take that dog to the vets because you need to find out what's wrong with this dog. And the handler was saying, no, no, it's fine. Um, I think I believe it was a pool dog. So it wasn't this guy's dog. It was a pool dog. Um, and he was saying, no, no, it's fine. Um, in the end, uh, the police got called to site for an incident. And whilst there, the handler mentioned it to the police. The police told the, the handler to take the dog to the vets. And in the end, uh, sadly, the dog ended up getting put down through ill health. Now, the talking point to that is whose responsibility is it for the welfare of the pool dog? Because it will poss possibly be a company dog. So if it's a company dog, who is responsible for that dog's welfare? Is it the, the company, the handler? But also, whose responsibility is it for that dog not to go to site? Is it the responsibility of the company to say, no, the dog's too ill? Or is it the responsibility of the handler to turn around and say, I'm not taking this dog because I don't think it's well enough to work? So I just want to get your, maybe your insight into that. Um, my, 
I'll, I'll let you go first and then I'll put my side in afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I'll call me. Um, so in regards to that situation, it's a pool dog, so it is on it's owned by a company. Now, that company, that dog is an asset. They should be taking care of that asset. That dog should be getting medical checks every six months, if not earlier. Um, and they should be looking after it. Any medical, you know, anything to do with its, its medical health should have been spotted by the people who work in the company. If it's a company dog, they must have a kennel. If they've got a kennel, they'll have a kennel hand. The kennel hand should have been the first one who spotted it because predominantly they're the ones that will be looking after it when it's not in use. Um, the other side of it is, yeah, you can say the handler has a responsibility as a handler to know when a dog is poorly. What we've just heard then might be the fact is that someone who says he's a dog handler might not even be a dog handler, might not have a qualification, might have no training whatsoever, pardon my French. Um, and he's just, you know, turned up to a company, they gave him a dog, he's went on a site and he's just thought nothing of it. Um, you know, and it looks bad on us at the end of the day, the people who are trained, who put the effort in. Um, you know, me, me and you both know we could spot an, an ill dog. I mean, you don't even have to be a dog handler to do that. Just be a pet owner and just care about your animal. Um, so I'd say, if, in fairness, it's probably both of them. They're both liable for that, for that, for that problem. And I really hope they get uh, prosecuted for animal cruelty. Mm. Yeah, one thing I should have said, one thing I should have said, I believe, or the dog handler that I know believes that the dog was around 12 years old, which for me is four, two to four years older than I would say it's safe to have a, a working dog on site. I mean, you have, you obviously have your agility. So in terms of like a NASDU's annual certificate, the dog will have to go for agility. But I would say once a dog, I mean, it all depends on the dog itself, obviously. But I would say once a dog starts getting 10 plus, it's very unlikely that the, a dog would be able to pass its agility. But obviously every dog is a little bit different. But um, I would say with a pool dog that even the company should say, like, once a dog gets to, say, 10 years old, so I believe that's what they do with the police. Once the police dog gets 10, that's it, no matter how good the dog is. It's actually, it's actually um, eight. Is it eight? So I think yeah, yeah, than that. Once, so, yeah, once they hit eight, yeah. It, well, it's very circumstantial, but the 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 um so that the mark line is eight um for the police. However, if the dog is still eight is still capable and healthy at that point, so if it's not been beaten up over the years, it's not took too many injuries, it may stay on until it's nine, but very rarely past that. Yeah. So if you if 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 you're thinking that this dog is is 12, this dog's four years past. Um, this dog's four years past what a police would normally work a dog to. Um, but I think it shows because the handler I know said that he hardly got the dog out of the van whilst he was there. But I think because he knew the dog was ill or he, he kind of knew that the dog wouldn't be able to get out and do a patrol. Um, so I think, I think the handler knew, but I, I said to you, it's one of them, it's one of them things. Does a handler say, no, I'm not taking that dog to work? And they say, okay, well, you're not earning a night's work. Or is it a case of he's like, well, if I don't take this dog, then I've got no money, so I'm going to have to. Therefore, you, although it's still a bad decision from the handler, you kind of, there are there will be certain handlers and there maybe will be certain people that will say, well, I just need to earn my money no matter how I get it. And yes, okay, the dog takes a hit for that. But the most important thing is, is that I can put food on the table for my kids the next night so yeah i can i can see that see and i understand that point and when you've got a family relying on you that is a very like a very sore point i understand that but at the same time you've got to have the moral compass not to do nothing you know what i mean you've got to you've got to do something to, to make you when you know something's not right like if a company is handing you a dog that is 12 years old and you can clearly see that it's ill and it's sick. Do you really want to work for them? Would it be so bad not working for them and going to and you know having to go and find another job? Because I tell you what, the moment someone not handed me a dog like that, one, I'd be saying to them, I'm leaving and the dog's coming with me. And if you want to get me arrested, call the police because I'd love for them to see this. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I I said about this at training last Friday, and uh, my trainer said that he I don't know when this was, it's probably years and years ago. Um, he was working a site and um, he had a handler come on to work with him 
and um, he noticed that the handler wasn't getting the dog out and patrolling. So he went over there and said, like, are you going to get the dog out? And the guy said, no, no, I don't touch dog. Like, <clears throat> I don't touch the dog. He's like, what do you mean don't touch dog? He goes, no, I drive, pick the dog up, put it in the van, go to work, and then I'll go back home. I'll go back, drop the dog off, then I'll go home. So he's like, well, you don't touch the dog. So he's like, no. So the my trainer opened up the boot, got the dog out, took the dog out for a patrol, and then put it in his put it in his van in the cage. And the guy come over, he's like, give me my dog back, give me my dog back. And he said, no. He said, you ring your boss, tell him to come here, down here and get the dog. I ain't giving you the dog back. Because it's it, it's it's just morally wrong that you that you have a handler that won't that won't patrol the dog because that's where the dog gets its exercise, that's where the dog can go for the go for a toilet. So the dog knows it's going to be go, be able to go to the toilet. If you get if you pick a dog up two days in a row and leave it in a van for 10, 12 hours, that dog more or less knows when it gets picked up, it's like, I'm not going to go to the toilet for the next 12 hours. Therefore, it may not drink as, enough water. So it think I don't want to drink water because I don't want to need to go to the toilet. It may stop eating food because it might think I don't want to eat food because I don't want to need to go to the toilet. So it's it, it, it's one of the things. But um, like I say, like we said, I think it's it's to do with the company and the handler. But you just need to be strong enough as a handler to say I'm not taking that dog. I'm not going out and, and working that dog. Yeah, hundred percent, mate, hundred percent. And as you said, it's it's neglect. You know, leaving a dog in that in a car for that long. Yeah, it's just wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I was working earlier this year, and um, we, I can't remember what it was. We was at me and Cooper were out working working site, and I kept giving him water, and he kept throwing up. And I'll give him water, and he'd throw up. So in the end, um, I rang like the emergency vet at like three o'clock in the morning, and I said, "Look, every time I give the dog water, he just throws it straight back up." And they said, "Right." Well, I said, "Well, don't give him water for like three or four hours." And then, um, and then, if it's no better in the morning, come go to a vet. So I was like, okay. So I left it three or four hours, didn't give him any water, and then I gave him water, and he threw it back up, and went to the, went to the vets. I think it cost me like ninety hundred quid or whatever. Um, and they put him, they gave him some tablets. Um, I can't remember exactly what they said it was, but they gave him some tablets. Now that was like. A, I think it was a Monday and I still had Tuesday and Thursday shift to go. And I just rang the boss and said, well, I won't be in the rest of the week. I'll take two days on with me because I'm not going to take the dog to site when I know that he's ill or not even risk. Like he might have been all right for the Thursday, but I was like, you know what? He just give him the rest of the week off. Then by Sunday, he'll be, he'll be fine again. But just to myself, I couldn't, A, I didn't want to have to deal with, uh, an ill dog whilst trying to look after a site and B I didn't want to make him be in, the, be in his crate having to patrol when he clearly just didn't want to when he was throwing up if I opened up the cage for him to come out he would just sign and lay there and he's like do I really have to so in the end I've more or less done static so I just I just walked around site on my own I'll get him out to go to the toilet now obviously but I ended up just walking around my site as a as a static really just because I he was too, I, he just didn't want to get out of the van. So I was like, you know what? If you don't want to get out of the van because you're ill, I said, that's fine. And I'll just do a static job for the last four, three, four hours. Yeah, yeah. I'd say it's, you know, it's just perfect example of someone who actually cares about the dog, um, pays attention to their behaviours, what's going on with them. Um, you know, my, my, my biggest one with my dog, um, he, uh, I figured out he had hay fever. So he gets hay fever or... or through the summer, um, and then he started getting like crack nose, uh, crack pads, and stuff like that. And it was a recurring thing. So you know, I spent the time, and you spent the time, and you know, I had to groom him, I had to put special cream on him, special cream on his paws, and I had to do that every time before I went to shift. You know what I mean? And that, and that, that means less time sleeping, you know, less time preparing food and everything. You know, it's you know, lucky enough, I've got my partner that really helps me out now and really looks after him um, most of the time. Now, so it takes the stress off me a little bit, so I can crack on with work. Um, but yet, you know, at the end of the day, you, you've got to you've got to look after the dogs. Even with, like you said, about spending money at the vets, I hate people who do that. They um, they say, you know, they say, oh, my dog's ill, but I don't really want to be spending that much money at the vets. It's like, you you got the dog, you accepted that responsibility. Yeah. You 
you should you need to go and spend that money <laughs> i remember i remember uh, last year uh, working a site and um there was a bit of glass around and um although i tried to avoid it best i could try to clean it up best i could um the dog ended up cutting its paw but when i say there was glass it, i'm not talking about one area i could have avoided i'm talking like there was buildings that have been smashed up and it was just everywhere um and i worked that site for like two or three months and in the end one day he did he, in, he did end up cutting his paw and i think i earned 120 pound for that shift and i went to the vets and it cost me 130 pounds but I couldn't have earned that 120 quid without him being there anyway. So really it's only cost me a tenner because, okay, yes, I've had to pay, I've, I've had a night wages wiped out in the morning, but I wouldn't have been able to earn that anyway without him as such, because I couldn't have done that job as a static. It had to be as a dog handler. So although, although it wiped out a night's work, he earned that money anyway. So he, he kind of earned that money to, in order to be treated by a vet. Yeah, yeah, 100%. If, if you ever go, um, it's a little uh, trick I picked up, like, from a, a couple of guys who were in the police. Um, so if you're ever on a site where you have do have things like that, like glass around, stuff like that, you can still get, I'll try and find some for you and I'll send you the link, but you can still get the old um, riot shoes for dogs that have a thick rubber sole on the bottom of them. They're great because you can leave them on, they're breathable, they don't affect the dog's paws, but no glass is getting through them. Yeah. So it's good yeah. for sites like that. We'll move on to the second uh, thing for today. And that is, it came up in my uh, live yesterday. And that is regarding uh, auditors. Now, we'll do a brief one over this. I don't think it's something you need to get into much. Um, but we'll just do a brief one on kind of auditors. Now, people that don't know what auditors are there, especially a lot of them do it on YouTube now. So they'll basically turn up with a camera stand around filming, wait for you to go over and ask what, they, what they're doing. They'll say, I'm just making a video. Someone will say, you can't record. And then they'll basically go into an absolute tirade of ripping you to, part, uh, ripping you to pieces about what their rights are, et cetera. So um, I've, I said in my live yesterday, I can see the pros, but I can also see the cons because whilst you're trying, not dealing with someone because, okay, maybe you don't need to go over there and talk to them. Um, but possibly while you're, whilst they're, whilst they're kind of hanging around, maybe you miss something that you would probably spot without them being there. Um, so, what's your kind of thing on auditors? Um, so, with auditors, uh, I love. Well, first of all, I love the fact that they post all this on YouTube. Um, don't get me wrong; there are there are people who are auditors are doing it for the right reasons. They they went out to do this to basically make sure people that are in power are not taking liberties and they know the law and they're saying, you know, they're standing up for the rights, which fair to them, that, that's fair enough. Although there are people that take the piss, pardon my French again, um, but it's the same in, any, you know, in any role, same, same in, our, in, our, in our job, there are people that aren't meant to be doing this job, there are people that aren't meant to be police officers. Um, so in that sense, you know, you, you've got to take the good with the bad. But with regards to them, I mean, they're a perfect training aid, to be honest. You sit there and watch one of their videos and see how they approach people, how they cause conflict with people and stuff like that. And you just, you can watch the videos and see how they do it. You, you know the techniques. So if you spend just a little bit of time watching them and you, you learn from other people's mistakes, you can very quickly, easily identify the quickest way to deal with them. You walk up to them, you introduce yourself, you say who you are, why you're there, Tell them you want to know what they're doing. And when they tell you, I'm an auditor, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, you just say, all right, you're on public land. I appreciate that. Don't come over this side of the fence. Bye. And walk away. Yeah, I think that I think that was <laughs> I think that was one of the things I was trying to say. That you only deal with these people as much as you have to. If you don't need to deal with them, then just let them do what they're doing. If, if you're if they're out on if you're working a, a gate entry to, I think the one that I watched was a gate entry to a festival, but he's just out on the road filming and things like that if that's there's nothing there's nothing illegal against that so you kind of just you don't need to go over and talk to him you just kind of say all right well you just keep doing whatever you're doing and as long as you don't come inside the ropes then that's fine if you want to stay out there the only problem i had with the video i said in my in the live the only the issue i had with the video was the fact that uh they filmed all of security they filmed all of the cctv 
where all the CCTV cameras were and they filmed where the police kind of gathered. And to me, that was not great. I would say if I was looking at that as part of counterterrorism, that is kind of hostile reconnaissance, I think it's called, where you've kind of done it for someone already um, to the point where he knocked on the on the walls of the event so they knew what material the walls were, they knew how high the walls were and things like that. So I can see the good parts of it, but I think there is a line where they start showing a little bit too much in terms of where everything is, where you, where you can sneak in, where you can jump a fence, where there's no security where you might be able to get in. Um, so I think there is good and bad parts. And like I say, if there's the wrong people watching that video and are thinking about an attack, then they, they've already done their hostile reconnaissance and they can just make a plan for next year. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you with that. Yeah, because they've obviously, you know, the police have got like the, you know, the Anti-Terrorism Act and stuff like that, where they can uh, deal with hostile reconnaissance in a certain way. Um, the only, the only thing is, is the, the best advice I can give to any security officer or any security dog handler is, if you see someone doing it, if he's on, if he's on public land, and there is not an, an immediate incriminating evidence that he is up to no good, hence like wires hanging out of his bag with something that looks like it's taken down or something like that, you know, don't bother because the police can't do anything about it. So you ain't going to be able to do anything about it. Leave them to it because it's going to cause you more trouble than it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that, I think the biggest thing to take away from it, take away from it is only deal with them if you absolutely have to. You don't need to deal yeah. with them. Just, just let them be. Because at the end of the day, if they never had a, if they never had a, what people would call a vlogging camera, so a camera you use <laughs> to make video logs, if they was just doing it with the phone, you probably wouldn't bat an eyelid anyway. You no, just no, you wouldn't. And you just the think other thing, TikTok or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the other thing as well is like, you know, a lot of people say about audiences, like they are them ones that try and get a rise out of people. So they'll call them names and, you know, yeah, stuff like that. And it, it, as a security officer, if you've been doing this long enough, you should know the best way to deal with that is to take is to take them take the piss out of yourself. Mm. So when they come up and try and call you names, you just turn around and go, "Yeah, I'm imitation bacon, mate. I'm a short, stubby, fat security officer. Nice to meet you. I'm off to do my job. Have a good day." And what they ain't got nothing to say because you've just took it. You've took it away from them. Yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit like a bully. If a bully starts calling you names, and you if you kind of take that name on. If you kind of take that name on as a as a kind of joke, it loses its power because it, it, they realise it doesn't affect you anymore. Uh, right. So the third uh, bullet point that we've got for today is uh, about uh, posting about handlers on social media, good and bad. So I don't know. Let me say that again. <laughs> that was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Not at all, Michael. Not at all. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one knows. No one knows. No one knows. Uh, right. The, the the third bullet point I've got for today's uh, podcast is um, explain why posting about handlers is good and bad. This is social media. So you, if I hand it over to you, and you give your input on that, and then I'll I'll put my input into it afterwards. Okay. So um, so my view sort of on this this thing is is that like there's two reasons that people will like use social media as a platform to post it on dog you know, other dog handlers. And it's, you know, it's out of two reasons. One, out of concern, or two, out of spite. Um, out of concern, it could be concern for the, the welfare of the dog, it could be concern for the public and people working in the area because the handler obviously doesn't know what he's doing, or it could be concern for the company that he works for because it's going to end up giving them a bad name and losing them work, which is understandable. However, guys, if, you know, if you're doing that sort of stuff and you want to, you want to deal with someone who's not meant to be doing the job or, you, or there's someone that is, you know, abusing their animal, is not looking after it properly, inform the right people. You know, if, if they're not looking after their animal, contact their RSPCA and report them, all right? If they start beating their animal in front of you on site, call the police, tell the police that they're assaulting an, an, an animal. You know what I mean? It's, at the end of the day, it's your, it's your duty as a dog handler, you know how they should be treated with respect. And if, if you see someone you know, not looking after them, then make the proper precautions, contact the right people. You don't need to post it on social media. Go to, go to your boss, go to the local authority, even go to your local, your trainer, 
and speak to him and see what he says, because they're going to be the people that know how to deal with this sort of thing. Um, as for the people posting out of spite, well, we all know what we think of them. Um, they're usually the ones trying to take other people's work, try and make people look bad, just for purely their own personal gain. There are some of them in the industry, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully, you know, as time goes on, we'll weed them out. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of my opinion on it. Um, over to you, Michael, what do you think? Uh, I, I, I can see the benefits of it because with social media, you can get the, rep, the word around quicker because nine times out of ten, that handler will leave that site and be on to the next site. So it, I, can see, I can see why getting his picture around or his registration around can be a good thing but I don't think it's the best way to go about it. Now, as I said, you can get the, route, the word around very quickly, but you have to be very careful about throwing stones in glass houses because what, what we do know about this, what we do know about this industry, what we do know about this industry is that a photo out of context can, can ruin your, ru it could ruin your dog handling career. Um, it could be a case that, uh, let's say let's say you've got two dogs you've got your you've got your dog that you actually work but you have to take your retired 12 year old german shepherd to work with you because you can't leave him at home it only takes uh, a photo of you taking your 12 year old dog for a toilet on site for someone to say that you you're patrolling and working that 12 year old dog now you may get that dog out just to go to the toilet every hour or every couple of hours whatever it is but a photo out of context can spread like wildfire just as much as someone uh, say you taking a photo of someone's dog cramped up in a car, like I was saying earlier in a in a Ford Ka, like yeah. So you had so I think you have to be careful about throwing stones in glass houses. That you, I don't want to say you 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 get caught doing something you shouldn't because I think the large majority of handlers would, would never do something that they shouldn't. But it's only a it's only a um, a photo out of context that can ruin you. So let's say let's say you um, you post on social media about a dog handler um, who has got a vicious dog, and um, you say this hand never, don't trust this handler with their dog because their dog's out of control. The handler doesn't know how to control their dog. So you post that on social media, it spreads everywhere. Then you go to site the next night and you're doing muzzle training with your dog. So you put a muzzle on your dog and you take the dog for, for a patrol. Someone, someone uh, takes a picture of you uh, patrolling your dog on a muzzle and turns around and says, this handler cannot control his dog. The only way that he can control his dog is if he muzzles it and then posts that out. Now that may be massively incorrect, but if you're patrolling a dog on a muzzle, and someone's saying that the only way you can control it is by muzzling your dog, then that's kind of just as, it looks just as bad as you just posted a picture of someone saying that they can't control their dog. Yeah, um, it's, that, it's that old saying, isn't it? Um, a picture paints a, paints a thousand words. Um, and it's true. It, it's true. You know, it, it could be something completely innocent, um, something, a you know, precaution you put in, as you said, putting a muzzle on one of the big ones, you might be putting a precaution in because you might be doing the same thing. You might know that there's members of staff about and that you want the dog muzzle to make them feel more comfortable um, when the dog's around and someone could take, take a photo of it and it can get taken complete, completely out of context. So you have got to be very socially aware of what you're doing when you're on site and when you're working. Yeah. Yeah. So like I say, it's, it's good and it's bad. It obviously, you can obviously get the word around very quickly, but it can also paint you in a bad picture. And like I say, it's throwing stones in glass houses where you might get caught on a picture out of context. And, and you, you wouldn't like that to, you wouldn't like that to happen. So maybe, maybe just like I say, the way you said about it first about just taking it to your company, taking it to RSPCA, taking it to NASDU or whoever it is, going back to the company um, and just going through that way rather than posting on social media. Um, and potentially starting something, starting something off for yourself that you didn't need to, because just as just as much as you think it might be the right thing, a lot of people nowadays can't deal with uh, backlash on stuff if they feel like they're right. So, I mean, it's it's very similar to to some of the stuff that I post on YouTube. I might post a video out and think, well, that's a really good video, 
And then like the first four or five comments is someone backlashing or someone having a go at me. And yes, you do say that the wrong way. I think I'm, I think I'm probably mentally and I'm, I think I'm mentally uh, capable of dealing with that and just, and just thinking, right, well, that's their opinion. This is my opinion. That's their opinion. But I think there, there are a lot of people in the dog handling industry that are, I'd say, I think the nicest way to say it is like, is men, less mentally strong, let's say. So a little bit mentally fragile where they possibly can't deal with that. So before you post out on social media, you need to, you need to think, are you capable of dealing with backlash on something? And a lot of people turning it back onto you and, and digging you out. Are you capable of dealing with that if it happens? And if you're not, then don't post it in the first place because even the worst thing is, is if you post it up, get back backlash and you delete it, the next time you post something, people will remember who you are and they'll give you backlash on that. So you have to, you have to think about before posting something online is can you deal with it if it turns back onto you? Yeah, if you can't, if you, yeah, if you can't take it, don't give it. Mm, yeah. yeah. Okay, we are on the final point, and I know you've been looking for the, looking forward to this. So this is the <laughs> final point. So what we're going to try and do with the last point of of each um, of each episode is that we are going to try and educate. We are going to try and uh, burst a myth. Um, and today's one is I'm going to hand it over to you, um, and it is explain why asking if we have a German Shepherd or an Alsatian is dumb. So over to you. Right. So basically, so German Shepherd and Alsatian, we've heard it tons of times, especially if you've been a dog and you've been asked that question at once at one point in time or another. All right. First of all, let's just bust the myth straight away. It's the same thing. All right. It's not, they're not different breeds. It's the exact same dog. All right. So, Please stop asking that because you look like a moron, especially in front of another dog handler that actually knows this. Um, so basically the story is, is that, so the name Alsatian, it comes from a town on the border between uh, France and Germany. And the town was given to Germany um, from France after such and such a war. I can't remember the exact, uh, the exact war. Um, I'll try and pronounce the name now. Alessandro Luris. I probably just butchered that. Yeah. <laughs> what I'll do, what I'll do in the what I'll do in the video is I'll put a little subtitle there of how to of, of the actual word and people can try and pronounce it themselves. Yeah, yeah. It probably doesn't help with the Scouse accent either. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so that, that was the town. But basically where the where the myth came in is obviously in World War One. Obviously, we, we were up against the Germans, right? So Britain decided in all their wisdom that they were not going to call German Shepherds German Shepherds anymore. So they adopted the name Alsatians. And it was really prominent in this country. It was not prominent in like the United States or anywhere else. It was just us that sort of adopted that name. So it stuck in this country for years and years. And um, officially it got changed back to German Shepherds in 1977. Um, the official name so you know the, the dogs weren't registered as Alsatians they were registered as German Shepherds now in this country um, so when you hear someone say I have an Alsatian they're just saying I have a German Shepherd in a posh way because officers don't like to say German when they were fighting them. <laughs> which which one which one do you prefer do you, do you which, like I know that I know your dog is a German Shepherd or what, or what, but what one would you prefer to say? Would you prefer to say, I have an Alsatian, or do you prefer to say, I have a German Shepherd? Given, take away what the actual specific name of the dog is now, which one would you rather say you had? Um, I think for me, German Shepherd, um, because at the end of the day, it's, the, it's their lineage, you know, a lineage, it's where they're from, you know what I mean? It's, it's where the breed, breed originates from, and they're well known around the world, you know, they're not psychopathic animals but the strong animals they've been through wars they've been man's best friend you know and they've done so many things um it's like you know what a lot of people don't know is that one of the um so after after the second world war um when everyone rotated home and stuff like that they had military dogs they had working dogs still in the pipeline that were meant to go out to handlers that got cut short um, and never went out 
Um, and they actually all, like, they came away. And what they did was just they repurposed them dogs and we trained them. And most people would, would have thought they, they'd become police dogs. But one of the first jobs a German Shepherd ever did in this country after the war was um, a blind guide dog. Okay. Um, and not a lot of people know that. Um, they're, they're amazing animals. And I think just, you know, giving them their name, German Shepherd, just pay, pays a homage to the lineage. Alsatian does sound bad also, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know. It depends how you look at it. <laughs> you know what, my you know what, my next German Shepherd is going to be called Alsatian. I'm going to name. Him. <laughs> just going so to when, so when someone says, <laughs> like, so when someone says, <laughs> when someone says, what dog you got? I can say I've got a German Shepherd, but his name's Alsatian. They've got what? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that is that kind of myth busted a german shepherd and an alsatian is exactly the same dog please stop asking which is in 1977 they changed the official name of an alsatian back to german shepherd and that is what they should be known as unless you meet my next dog called alsatian <laughs> look forward to meeting them <laughs> <laughs> just not in a dark alley <laughs> I think that uh, I think that was a, a good episode. I think we got through lots of um, lots of different topics. We went off on our own little tangents, um, but yeah, I think I feel like that was that was a decent episode. How did, how did you think it went? Yeah, I, th I think it went good. Um, obviously, some good topics. Um, so yeah, it was nice to talk about these things. It's also good to see you again, mate. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to do this. Um, you know, I feel honoured. You know. Yeah. Getting a, getting all famous and stuff with your five hundred subscribers. <laughs> I got I got I got a notification through from YouTube saying you have enough subscribers to fill a jumbo jet. So I was I was actually looking. I was like, because I, I I want to try and do it in certain things and like, oh, what could I do? What could I do to with this amount of subscribers? Or I can fill a jumbo jet. Well, when I get to a thousand, what could I fill with a thousand? Could I fill like a a little nightclub? You can fill a little nightclub with a thousand people. And I think that's just a nice way. And then one day it'll be that you can fill Wembley Stadium with your 90,000 subscribers. But um, yeah, yeah, well, actually, technically, technically, you've got 1,000 subscribers already because you've got one, you've got 500 dog handlers and plus the dogs. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> so that's one way to look at it. Um, but yeah, I, I feel I, the reason I got you, the reason I got you to do this with me is because I, I, we get along and I think we can both have honest chats and we can call each other out if we feel that some if one of us is, is wrong um but yeah i feel like that was a good what we will ask is if you want to ask me or uk security 101 uh, a question in the comments section below you can write questions in there and then we will read them and we'll answer we'll answer some in the comments but we'll, we'll answer some in maybe the next episode um if anyone's got any topics for the next ep episode um, we, we will have a look at that as well. We're not guaranteed to, to pick your topic, but if there's something that we feel like is worth is worth talking about, then we will. Um, so, and also make sure if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, subscribe down below for loads more videos. Um, is there anything else that they can do? Um, no, no, I think that's pretty much it. You, you've much. covered all bases. As, um, yeah, guys, as, as Michael said, give a big thank you to Michael for getting in touch with me and organizing this. Um, like subscribe to the channel especially if you're new into the industry this is a good way to get information there's tons of experienced people in the in the chats uh big shout out to all the guys that follow you know that have followed me when my channel was up and going and you know thank you very much for all the support and the support to michael and uh yeah just definitely subscribe to michael because if you don't i'll nick the wheels off your car <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no way I'm just kidding I'm just kidding <laughs> Uh, no worries. Cheers for that, mate. And we will catch you all again in episode three. And yeah, thanks for watching. See you later. See you Bye. later, guys. Bye-bye.